Did you know you can support The Techology Show when you shop at Amazon.com? Become a friend of the show by starting your shopping at thetechologyshow.com slash shop. It's Tuesday, January 28th, 2014. Check out that cool background. Let's let that fade away. Oh, yeah. And live from the Technology Show <laughs> podcasting studios in rural, snowy winterland, <laughs> South Carolina. <laughs> I'm Matthew TG. I'm Heath Mulliken, and I've got plenty of bread and milk. And I'm Tony Casey. Welcome to the Technology Show, weekly podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. This is episode 200. And 33, so you're going to have to explain you the just, bread and milk reference. You yeah. just sent terror through my heart because I have no milk. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've never understood buying uh, bread and milk. Any, we, we are here. It is not snowing. They have let the schools out here in Pickens and Oconee County where Tony's daughter and my kids go to school. No weather yet, <laughs> but just the threat of it. They're doing early dismissal. So it's kind of thrown. And everything. explain what happens at the grocery stores when this when this happens. And here. when this happens, like, okay, so probably two days ago, Sunday, yeah. they're like, it was snow Tuesday. <laughs> it just floods. People flood the grocery store. Right. Bread and milk. Bread and milk. Totally it wipes gone. the shelves out. Uh, now, when we got our milk yesterday, um, it, it was fine. Plenty there. I have out, however, um, one time in Denton, again, had not started snowing yet, went to the grocery store, and Denton's a small town, and somewhere this picture saved one gallon of milk. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about the whole rack empty, one gallon of milk sitting there. When I moved, I, I know we got to get into the show, but uh-huh. when I moved to Philadelphia, it started snowing. Got in the car. I mean, the roads are clear. Got in the car, went to the grocery store. Like, man, I gotta get bread milk. Gotta get to the grocery store. <laughs> There's nobody there shopping. Plenty of bread, pl- plenty of milk. I'm like, what are these people doing? They don't know what they're doing. So, well, and add this right here that even if they go out and if it snows tonight, by noon tomorrow, all the snow's gone. Oh yeah. So, like, I what, have, what, do you, what what do you need it for? I distinctly remember eighth grade. I got on when I got on the bus that morning. It was snowing heavily. Got to school, 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock. They sent everybody home. Noon, snow's all gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. Melted. <laughs> right. Ridiculous. All right. We, we, just, we just love to treat our children right, I think. We want to let them experience the snow. Okay. It's such a, maybe, that's, maybe that's the theory behind it. Maybe it's not that there's danger. Maybe it's that we want these poor experience. children who do not know what snow right. is <laughs> to have the opportunity. The, the bad snow. thing is, them we don't, we, <laughs> snow is fine. <laughs> We don't. We do not want the ice. Right. No ice. Yeah, that, would that would be hey, bad. Absolutely. Hey, let's talk giveaways. Hey, yeah. So last week we had a great guest on, Dr. Keith Jury, and we're giving away uh, his two books that we discussed last week: Soul Shaper and Gather. We're going to be giving away both those books to one lucky winner. So you can go to the Technology Show dot com slash giveaway, and then also our great guest to get today. We're going to be giving away a copy of her book, "Sitting at the Feet of the of the Rabbi Jesus." I'll get that all out eventually. So this week, two great giveaways. Now listen, we try to be fair on the Technology Show, and sometimes you know there's going to be winners, there's going to be losers. But even if you don't win, I'll tell you what you can do. You go to thetechnologyshow dot com slash shop. Go to the Amazon link. And you can help the show out just by shopping on Amazon, or you if you use you don't Google win those Chrome, books, you can buy them. That's, That's exactly right. right. Buy a case. <laughs> buy, a case. <laughs> buy one for your mother. Uh, you can also, if you use Google Chrome, go into uh, their extension store, their app store, and download the Technology Show extension. Then all you have to do is go to Amazon. It automatically. It is the wonder of technology, and uh, just thank you for your support. And again. Uh, and, and at the end of the show today, I will have the official purchase of the week yes. to share with okay, everybody. That's right. Very good. Yeah. Hey, um, many of you noticed that last week uh, we had our really very first sponsor for an episode, Indiana Wesleyan University, or, sem- or excuse me, Wesley Seminary at Indiana Wesleyan University, sponsored last week's episode. And uh, they're going to be doing that uh, for at least in that six months, two of our podcasts a month, they, a month they will be sponsoring. And uh, let me just say that uh, if you're looking for 
um, a, a show to sponsor, uh, we highly recommend our own. Isn't <laughs> yeah, that a surprise? Right. That's um, right. But really, we feel like uh, one of the benefits that we can give you is that when you sponsor an episode, that literally lives on for years. And so we've got some podcasts that are two, three years old. We are still getting hits on that. Yes. If, if someone had sponsored that episode, it is your watermark that shows up. Yeah. We do in the middle of the show. Um, we play your promotional video. And so if that's something you think you might be interested in, head over to the technologyshow.com and uh, forward slash sponsor. If you send us a mug with your logo on it, we will drink coffee exactly or right. Tony will drink tea out of that. That's exactly yeah, sweatshirts right. or hoodies, we'll wear them. You know, yeah. that. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, we'll, we'll do anything. We'll sell I mean, out. I mean, <laughs> exactly. we will sell out. We'll we, sell we, have, we have priced the Mac Pro that we need and we will do anything. <laughs> Uh, all right. Hey, listen, let's uh, talk about our guest this week. Our guest is Lois Tverberg. Lois has been teaching and writing about the Jewish background of Christianity for the past 15 years. Growing up in a devout Christian home, she started her career as a college professor after earning her Ph.D. in the sciences. Her life took a turn, however, when she discovered the importance of the Bible's cultural setting and began studying in the land of Israel and learning Hebrew and Greek. She, excuse me. Uh, she's since written three books on the topic and is currently working on a fourth. She writes full-time from her home in Holland, Michigan. Uh, Lois, welcome to the show. And I know that the weather up there is wonderful right now. Oh, gosh, wow. <laughs> I-, I was thinking more of the line from uh, the weather outside is frightful, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Uh, we, I actually, it's, I'm looking at um, drifts of a, almost up to my head uh, <laughs> over by where I've used my snow thrower to clear out my driveway. I know you guys never even seen a snow thrower, but it's just amazing out here. Well, so, you know, Matthew's, Matthew's theory uh, here was that they let school out so the kids can experience snow. So maybe we could work out a student exchange where we yeah. send our kids up to your house yeah. and they can experience snow. We will buy them shovels and they can come, please. <laughs> yeah. All right, hey, let's let's jump into the book here. Um, first, love this book. As yeah. I told you uh, in our pre-show, and then yesterday during our test call, we for me personally, I came in contact with this book uh, as Rachel Held Evans recommended it to us, and so a couple months within that, I read it and loved it, and um, was was fascinated at the very beginning by the story of your early interest in exploring the New Testament. But but after you found yourself in the New Testament class, you say. Quote, I was discouraged to learn that my professor believed, as did many others, that the New Testament was generally unreliable, composed of documents that had been written very late and were filled with legends from the early church. Talk about the initial effect that that had on you and then how you came to almost uh, kind of rediscover the New Testament. Uh, Well, uh, I would say that I grew up with plenty of Sunday school knowledge. And so I would say I wasn't unsophisticated as I walked into my college classes. And I wouldn't say that I was from a super conservative family either, that I that I just couldn't bear any kind of uh, critical review. But at the same time, the professors that I had were so radically skeptical mm-hmm. of the uh, the New Testament, the the idea that we just can't know uh, anything about what Jesus's actual words are because they're so kind of laid over with legend and accretions of a later period. Yeah. That was generally the feeling that my New Testament professors had. Yeah, yeah, and and then kind of talk about how you kind of grew out of that. In other words, you know, this later experience where things begin to kind of come alive for you. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, at my church, it was about 10 years later, and I guess that was about 15 years ago. Wow. (laughs) We were having a a presentation. It it was a multi-week presentation on the land and the culture of the Bible and it was by a guy who has led a lot of trips to Israel, a lot, produced a lot on the Jewish context. And uh, I signed up for it thinking, oh, that sounds kind of dry, but, you know, okay. And I had also kind of, even though I 
just tried to, to ignore it. I had kind of absorbed a little bit of that cynicism. And so this presenter kind of bowled me over because he was so uncritical and he was so excited about the biblical context and the history and the culture. And it really surprised me because he was not like my professor's. Yeah. So, it, and if anything, I was a little cynical. I was like, where is this guy getting his stuff? And that actually, because of my science background, and I have a, a background in, um, in research, I wanted to read his sources. And that's actually what kind of propelled mm. me into study. Um, I took a, a small class with him where we were reading the books that he had, uh, had read, uh, and then I wanted to start reading the scholars because it was bugging me so much that uh, I had learned one thing that was so opposite yeah. of him in college, and he was such a different voice. So, uh, yep. it, it doesn't take long to realize that a major concern of this book is not only about the Jewishness of Jesus, but also the influence of the Jewish culture and religion that the Messiah responds to and engages. So take some time just to explain to our audience why that is so important. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> big question, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, one easy way of looking at it is you well, the, uh, I think of Paul Harvey when you remember how he used to go on the radio and say, oh, you know, he'd tell this great background and then he'd say, and now, you know, the rest of the story. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, yeah. it always it fills in all of these gaps and just wonderful and you think, well, why wouldn't we know that? Um, but it has been, um, well, partly it's because of a huge increase in archaeology mm. and in actually post-Holocaust that there has been more availability of uh, study mm -hmm. that all of a sudden we have a lot of context Um his Jewish context and his first century culture, and all of a sudden it uh, it fills in gaps. It shows, one is that Jesus's words fit into a wider conversation that was going on. Mm. And often, and this was really surprising to me, his words get much more powerful and much better when you actually hear them in light of the rest of the conversation going on. Yeah. You know, yesterday, That's, Lois, you and I were talking, um, and I, you'd mm -hmm. asked me about just, you know, well, what are some of the things I liked about the book? And I think yeah. one of my comments to you was that um, it was an eye-opener to me. And, and again, I went to seminary, and so, uh, um, you know, unlike yourself, it's not like, uh, I mean, I didn't know a yeah. few things. <laughs> um, and yeah. um, what struck me about the book was how we take Scripture, and oftentimes we interpret it in the light of our own culture. Um, and I, I would guess from your own experiences with people, maybe some of the reactions of the book, I mean, I'm not alone here, right? Oh, sure. Of course. It, honestly, if you think about it, how else would we understand it? How, how what oh, other... What other way can we understand it but in light of our own culture? Mm -hmm. And really, our, our, uh, the Great Commission is about taking the scriptures to the end of the world. And so, honestly, out of necessity, we have been trying our best to make it make sense in the world that it is in. And so that's really been essential to Christianity. But it's kind of the next step is after you've gotten a little bit of the background of your own world, then it's the next step to say, now let's walk back and try to understand its world, which is a little harder. So One, one yep. thing, and, and I don't want to go too, ar too far off on a tangent, but this is just mm -hmm. on my mind. Yeah. Um, a lot of, there's been a lot of conversation about the Grammys the other night. One of the songs that was, was saying that was, you know, kind of supporting same sex marriages, one of the line, and I, th there, I do have a point here. <laughs> the, the, one of the line, one of the lines in this song is that the singer has a problem with people paraphrasing a book that's three thousand five hundred years old. And so, my question to you, Lois, yeah. would be: there, there seems to be in our culture that the Bible, because of its age, yeah. it's neither relevant or reliable. Yeah, but in truth, yeah, its age 
yeah. actually it makes it even more so. So am yeah. I like completely off base on that or are we, how do we fight that in our culture that just right. like you determined your New Testament professor? Yeah. Right. How do we how do we combat that worldview of the Bible? That it's that it's well, well. One thing is, uh, it, it, one usefulness of it is that it does speak with a different voice into a conversation. When all you can hear is your modern world, it's speaking. Of course, we can just throw that away and say, "Well, that's so old." But you have to wonder how ancient people have dealt uh, with the same issues. Mm. And you also do have to see what the live issues were going on Mm -hmm. in order to make it relevant. But once you have, yes, it gets more relevant the more you have of the context. Yes. Yeah, I think think some of our future questions here kind of are an example of that. So let's talk about, I mean, this book has a lot to say about the importance of of disciple making, uh, and also about disciple making within the first century rabbinic system. Share share some of that with our listeners. Okay. Well, uh, I guess, as you said, how people tend to read the Bible in their own culture, and you see that scene of Jesus with these 12 guys following around with him, with him, and you, and at first, person says, what kind of strange Pied Piper guy, you know, <laughs> with his groupies that he you know, travels the land? And you say, well, it's Jesus. You know, that's always <laughs> our answer forever. And and I don't want to take away the, um, the uniqueness of Christ. That's actually sure. one of the things sometimes people get a little threatened by is they're saying, oh, you're saying he's just a rabbi? No, actually, no, he's the son of God. And yet... He lived, the Lord decided to come to that world, and he actually came to a world where there was actually a tradition of uh, people wandering teachers, wandering the land with disciples uh, who traveled with them. So he was coming into a part of a world that actually had some expectations of what it wanted from disciples. Uh, It expected uh, it, this wasn't a, a, just an academic relationship. Right. It, they, it, it ex, you know, one is that expected an incredible amount of scripture knowledge, and that's mm. that's actually pretty essential even to <laughs> the rest of the culture. Yeah. That I would say that was one of my um, uh, big convicting surprises is how much scripture they actually expected. Jesus actually mm. expected his audience to know. Uh, much less his disciples and how much he referred to it. And when I say scripture, I mean Old Testament is right, what sure. he's speaking of. Yeah. So, yeah, one uh, of the things in this book that, um, a convicting moment, let me say that, um, is how you talk about within the Jewish culture of the day, how that knowing this scripture, learning this scripture, disputing this scripture was actually something that was very much prized and valued within the culture. I mean, I don't think I'm overplaying it here. Nope. Right, exactly. It, I uh, that as I just said, it, it was a big surprise to me. And uh, although I now have, uh, as I've been kind of learning about it within the wider world, actually, it's not so much Judaism as much as it is us. The Western world in the past fifty years has become amazingly secularized. Uh, and so uh, you think about it around the world, a lot of traditional cultures actually learn a lot of their their scriptures by memory, and they have yeah. a fairly high central location of religion, whereas the Western world, we, we're very secular. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sitting at the feet of the rabbi, Jesus has some wonderful things to say about studying and living out the scriptures within the context of community. So why is it important for the 21st century church to understand this? <laughs> well, <laughs> I love that laugh, Lois. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Like we set you up. We threw you a softball here, yeah. Lois. So knock, <laughs> knock this thing out of the park. Well, no, I'm laughing just because I'm thinking of myself being inside of my house for the past three days, only living on Facebook and email and uh, the fact that we have become little monks in our own little cells that never, we still are interacting with each other, but 
community is, uh, I have to laugh because we have become, and especially we don't, uh, we don't, we tend to avoid any website that doesn't agree with us. Yeah. And so we tend to only want to hang with our little friends and, uh, yes. So, uh, and okay, but yet I should be talking not so much about us, but Jesus's world. Um, what I talk about is uh, that part of that rabbinic dis- tradition and the disciple tradition, and actually it's very much still a part of Jewish study even now, is the idea that you learn in community with uh, a, a study partner, yeah. and uh, they uh, they're. It's your haver. It's actually the same word as for friend, but it means your friend in study. And it's someone who grapples with you and argues with you and has de- will, is willing to debate back and forth with you over the, the scriptures or whatever you're studying. Um, it, it, it's really good because it's uh, a good lesson to learn because... Uh, we in our culture say, oh, I've had my quiet time, and that is where I will hear God's voice. <laughs> but uh, really, you know, Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am among you. Hmm. And you actually hear um, uh, things the rabbis said just right around that time or a little after where the, where you actually hear saying, where two or three are gathered and are studying Torah there is the Shekinah, the Shekinah of God. It, you hear some, very analogous as Christ is speaking about his presence among us when we're studying the Bible together. You know, last week so. our, our guest on the show was Dr. Keith Drury. He's written two books. One is called Soul Shaper. It's about personal spiritual disciplines. And the second <laughs> one is Gather. It's about corporate spiritual <laughs> disciplines. Yeah. And, what, and what's interesting is he says, if uh, if you've, never read either book, he said, please start with Gather, uh, because our, we are so inundated in the evangelical movement with this idea of, of personal spiritual formation. He said yeah. that we absolutely ignore the corporate aspect yeah. of um, the spiritual disciplines, and, and this book is uh, it certainly highlights yeah. that. And isn't it, um, I, I think it was this book where you talk about um, you name a professor, and forgive me, I don't remember all the details, but a professor is is saying things, and it's in a Jewish context, mm. and he's even beginning becoming controversial, yeah. all all for the point. I think yeah. you say of, of trying yeah. to get people to respond yeah. that yeah. that it's not in agreeing, but it's in disagreeing yeah. that the yeah. good conversation that's happens. Right. That's right. He said, "Yeah, exactly." What he says, um, yeah. He's trying to, when he can't get anybody to disagree with him, he says, how can we learn anything if we don't disagree with each other? Yeah, Mm. the sparring in order to debate, that actually helps you understand how actually some of the conversations in the Gospels where Jesus is disagreeing on whatever, uh, it's, it's actually, he's actually part of a debate and when you hear everybody else speaking, he actually fits right in. And he, it's not an um, a angry prophetic rebuke as much as it is yeah. the, the sound of that strong uh, argument that they, they have a lot. Yes. It's so, it, it, our, yeah. our own podcast, we used to, you know, we have this opening line. At the very end, we used to end it by saying, the world's only antagonistic podcast. <laughs> and when we came up with that, it was antagonism in the sense of, um, we're going to make you think a little bit. We're, you know, we, oh, yeah. and we, we wanted to create that dissidence, but yeah. we eventually dropped it. Uh, Matthew and I both came to the agreement that the statement wasn't even accepted by people in the way that we meant it. It's not yeah. that we were just trying to goad people, yeah. but yeah. that there is something that yeah. critically happens in our thinking <laughs> yeah. when yeah. I look at you and say, I disagree with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I actually, uh, it took me a while, and I'm still working on that, to be comfortable to say, push back on me here. You know, mm-hmm. I, I have a couple friends that when I write chapters, I say, push back. Please disagree with me wherever you can, because that just makes it better. Yeah, uh, it, it really is very helpful. So, yep. Yeah, that's yep. Uh, some of that. Boy, we have to really train ourselves yeah. to it's, to be ready for that kind of thing. Yeah. You get well, to, it's and, a mindset you got to be ready for. 
it's very, especially when I, well, honestly, among us church folks, especially yeah. because uh, if people are really uh, worried about you bending, you know, uh, messing with the doctrines in any way that yep. you really can't have any honest discussion in some places. So you right, have to right. have an, a baseline of faith that uh, in each other and in, you know, your relationship, yeah. it, wow. it takes I, a lot of trust. So, and I think that yeah. like is why, you know, John Wesley was so good at making disciples is he understood the, he understood that. And so he, you have all these classes in societies where he wanted to create an environment of Push that back. pushback. Yeah. 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 And we yep. we don't like that today. So yeah. we don't make as many yeah. disciples because we want everybody to feel comfortable. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's true. And it's it's so much easier. I, uh, I come from uh, the Midwest, and most of my family right now lives in Minnesota. And uh, they actually call it, they call it Minnesota nice. And, uh, <laughs> That's great. It, it's kind of a... Well, there's a friendliness, you know, like Southern hospitality, but there's also a sense of you, um, woe be unto anybody who says something critical or honest to anybody. Oh, yeah. You yeah. must be nice at all times to the point where um, your your relationships never can get any deeper. And I would say that's poisonous to the the Havarim, uh, your your Havarim are your friends and study. You can't be. All you can do is nod at each other, and uh, and uh, which is what we do a lot in yeah. church. We kind of. And one thing I was going to. Uh, you were talking about uh, the other this other guy's book about gathering. One thing that hits me is that um, when we talk about gathering for worship, we tend to think in terms of uh, a, being a big audience. Yeah. listening to one teacher, which still is not community. It's an audience. Yes. And uh, you notice Jesus talks about where two or three are gathered, there I am. It, it, obviously, they, they had corporate worship like at the temple. There was a lot, there was that. But the synagogue was actually very communal. It was a conversation going on and disciple relationships, very communal. And it was very one-on-one -on -one and one-on-two. It really wasn't just one talking head with a lot of people listening. Yeah. So, so let me go off script here a bit, Lois. How much do you think within the evangelical church in the United States, I'm talking about our culture only, how much yeah. of this is so intermingled with what I call... Um, Americanized Christianity because yeah. we value yeah. so much individuality. I pull myself up by my bootstraps, you know. Yeah, yeah, very much so. There's uh, there's a very strong individualism of uh, me, myself, and I. And um, oh, what did they call that? There's a there's a woman who she she's quoted in a book that she had kind of come up with her own main concept of God, which she doesn't need church. And she, and she called it Sheila. Her name was Sheila. And she called it Sheila ism is that she was just going to worship her own personal feelings. Uh, I would say that that's very much our, um, uh, Western, but especially American, um, uh, uh, anxiety about being with other people and being challenged in our faith. Um, and, and then also, you, you know, you cannot say anything to disagree with something uh, with uh, somebody who's more liberal than you are without getting yeah. called some nasty name either. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it goes both ways. Yeah, you know? You know, right. Our you experience know. on this show, I mentioned to you that we had Rachel Held Evans on. And, and here's the yeah. thing that's interesting that if if you sat Rachel Held Evans and I down at the same table, I would I I can tell you that we won't agree on everything. Um, but but here's the point. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, I love reading her books. I loved her as a guest on the show yeah. because she is a person right now in the evangelical mo movement that is asking the questions yeah. that need to be asked, and even if. You know, there are points of disagreement. We need to be able to articulate, um, well, then why would we disagree with that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I agree completely. I, uh, it's, and it's, uh, it's, 
it's hard to be the person in her shoes. I mean, it's terrifying to be the voice of uh, that uh, because you you get such a swamp of criticism, especially yeah. if you're online and everybody's anonymous and people can write no. their nasty little uh, uh, feedback and not be called on the carpet. Part of community, you know, we're talking about that the web is communal. Well, it isn't when it's anonymous that you can't take responsibility yeah, for good. those words that are attached to you as a person, you know. You know, one of the strengths of this book, clearly, is how you, on many occasions, illuminate a New Testament passage by interpreting it within its Jewish and Middle Eastern culture. And so uh, I, I want you, just, you know, for our listeners, do this. I mean, give an example out of the book where you, you know, you illuminate a New Testament passage in the light of, the Jewish culture, the rabbinic culture, you know, something like that. Sure. Uh, do you mind if I use one from my next book? Oh, please. Hey, <laughs> go, yeah, ahead. Yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Hold favorite. on. Let me put it the Technology so- Show exclusive uh, yeah. banner real quick. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I, what I meant was the, the book I wrote after that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, actually for my, it's a promo for my next book. <laughs> which is called Walking in the Dust of Rabbi Jesus. So anyhow, but uh, that's the, uh, we can talk about that some other time. But um, one there, um, one of the things that you think about that we hardly realize exist in other languages are idioms. We think maybe it's only English where you say, uh, the old guy kicked the bucket. <laughs> well, you know what? Every language has idioms, sure. and there are actually lots of them, even in what Jesus is speaking about. And wow. so there's one passage, it's, let's see, it's part of the Beatitudes. It's where Jesus is talking about, let's see, um, let's see, uh, he starts off with saying, um, store up your treasures in heaven, uh, uh, and then he goes into, if your eye is healthy, your body will be full of light. And if your eye is bad, your body will be full of darkness. And, and you're wondering, what are we talking about, yeah. eyes and darkness? And I got to say, there's a lot of goofy things out there. Uh, there's new age people. Oh, we <laughs> You know, enlightenment from our inner light, you know. Uh, (laughs) But Jesus was not a Eastern guru. He was using an idiom. Mm. And uh, believe it or not, the there's a a, an idiom that uh, uh, you can find it several places in Proverbs. You can find it from Jesus' other places in New Testament, and you can hear it actually in modern Hebrew even. And that's when a person has a good eye, that means that they have a generous heart. If you have a good eye, you see the needs of those around you, and you help them. To have a bad eye means that you're stingy and self-centered. And so you, uh, uh, And so the person with a good eye actually is a generous person who gives to others. Yeah. And that plays and that, back into that storing up treasure bit. Yeah, right. I, exactly. And actually, you know what the next line is after this ah. is, yeah. for you, one, a man cannot serve two masters, yeah. Yeah. either yeah. money or God. And so all of a sudden, when you get that idiom, you've got three passages that all fit into one yeah, big good. sermon, whereas before you just had this odd saying kind of yeah. floating there, yeah. and you didn't really quite get the whole point. And that's the kind of thing is like, wow, it's like I got yes. new scriptures today. It's so cool. Thank you so much, because we're actually studying the Sermon on the Mount in our Wednesday night Bible study, and, and so okay. I'll, I'll give you full okay. credit for that. Okay. And let me say this to our listeners. This is exactly Good. what we're talking about. It, yeah, yeah, so in the book, uh, Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus, and you're in the second book here, um, what, what's the title of the second book? It's called Walking in the Dust of Rabbi Jesus. Yeah, the, your books are full of these things, absolutely full of these yeah. things, and they're so enlightening and so good. So so real quick, okay, you, we okay. know you've got another book coming out, and one of the questions in the chat room, I think this is a good place to ask it, is, okay. it, yeah. is your next book, is it finishing the trilogy? That was the quote, <laughs> yes. that was the uh, question. 
Yes, it is. Yes. It's and uh, I, people, uh, I joke myself that, you know, we're talking about Rabbi Jesus. We've yeah. done it. First book, Walking in the Dust of Rabbi Jesus. And people say, okay, what's the next book? Is it jogging with Rabbi <laughs> Jesus? You know, are you kind of wearing this motif a little thin? On vacation. Like Rabbi Jesus. I mean, the disciples were in a boat a lot. I like boating, yeah. Yeah. boating yeah. with Rabbi Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Boat with Rabbi Jesus. I like that actually. That's oh, <laughs> copyright. Oh, oh, oh. Copyright. It's got a, a R and a B. It's good. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. You have a question there, Heath? So, yes. Uh, I know you typed something there. In the oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, a, again, a question um, for, from one of us actually. Uh, do. Mm-hmm. In, in the light of your books and what you're writing about, do you think that pastors and teachers do a disservice to their to their people by not understanding the cultural context of Jesus when they preach or teach? Oh, well, um, say, I would say, say of course. You were going to say of course, yeah. Lois. <laughs> of course they do. And yet what I've learned is that there's it's no use to be angry at people for not knowing right mm-hmm. nobody right. has known a lot of these things they're cultural things a lot mm-hmm. of them are things that have come to light out of scholarly work in the past few centuries uh, actually even actually the past few decades and so people tend to uh, their first re- some people their reaction is I'm so disgusted. Why didn't anybody tell me this? Mm. And honest to goodness, you know, if your pastor knew what the good I was about, wouldn't you think he would work it into a sermon somewhere? (laughs) You know, why would, if they're really good insights, why wouldn't they put them in? And I would say that we should think in terms of that uh, people have just not known rather than there's some vast scheme that, and that the pastor himself is somehow, uh, you should be angry about him. I, I think uh, sometimes I have to tell people, don't do that. It's okay. Yeah. Just yeah. get excited. Don't be grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so, the Lord for his grace and our ignorance. I mean, yeah, because, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. That the spirit of God can still, uh, can still use some ignorant people. I'm, I'm very <laughs> thankful. Like myself. I'm very thankful for the passage that says you're not held accountable for what you don't know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. cause yeah. Oh, there's, there's so much yeah. I don't know. So yeah. It does raise a concern for me, though, Lois. Uh, I think the reason I was so uh, that I love the beginning of your book when you you talk about your initial reaction, you go to a New Testament class. The only part that you're given is a higher critical view of the scriptures, which throws it in with just myth and legend, and the nuggets of truth that you dig out in your books can only happen if our approach to the scriptures are serious. Mm-hmm. And what worries me is when we have young people who would end up in that same class that you were in, and for a lifetime, they are derailed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. It's, there's a tension there. Yeah. Because you need to be able to ask the harder questions and to sometimes doubt, you know, sure. to be able to say, okay, did Jesus not really say this or what was maybe everybody did speak like that back then right um you have to you have to approach the scripture seriously to then get to the beautiful truths that come alive uh, as you delve into the culture and delve into the rabbinic tradition exactly Um, good good stuff and it's hard to it's hard to not um how can i say this I guess what my happiest discovery was, because I was convinced that if you did take a harder look at the Bible, that there was only bad news to hear. And really what I got so excited about was that it's good news when you start looking more deeply. Things, you know, when you like read Jesus' parables in light of thousands of rabbinic parables that were actually, they have a lot of the same motifs. They have a certain structure that's the same. And all of a sudden, his words sound, make all the more sense. It's really, I'm, I got to say, an exciting time. And I often uh, say, you know, if I've got cool things in my books, I feel like 
I'm, I'm almost cheating because the material is so rich. Huh. It's not me. It's the really cool, yeah. wonderful things that are coming to light in scholarship. Good and I just point. happen to be kind of in the right place. Good so, um, Lois, before we let you go, where can our listeners find you on the Internet? Well, my website is OurRabbiJesus.com, O-U-R-R-A-B-B-I. G E S U S dot com, and so, uh, and uh, you can, and you can probably you can find my uh, uh, my Facebook page and all of those other types. Yeah, of, Facebook, so you can, Twitter, Google yep. Plus. It was very it's very easy to find you, Lois. Yep, yeah. Yep. Yep. Lois, thanks so much. Hey, this yeah. is drill. It's been a treat, great, great and um, you've been a fantastic guest too. Great. Yes, yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, we're going to keep up with you, and and I'm serious. We, we'd love to have you back in the future. Great, wonderful. Thanks so much. All right, blessings on you. Hey, thanks thank again. you. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, so one of those really good books that in the last uh, couple of years that I've read, and um, yeah. I, we, someone was read uh, mm. that they hit a couple likes on Facebook when I did a post, mm-hmm. uh, and there were two pastors, by the way, and one of, what I said to them was, th- this ought to be a reference book on right. the shelf of pastors and teachers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this has been, you know, part of. Um, uh, you agree. I agree. Well, there we go. It's, so what Tony said is right on. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a fantastic book. And so so I wonder, like, in, in the educational setting, which we were talking about, you know, your perch, mm-hmm. you approach, there, there is value to saying, okay, so, like, we're going to have John Oswalt on our show later on, and mm-hmm. his yeah. latest book is about the Bible among the men's, and yeah. wrestling with, with that. That's important to do. Yeah. How do we compare, how do we also contrast that by teaching these kinds of things and that kind of setting to like where is the where is that where is this class on this content that we're talking about yeah. today yeah, yeah absolutely um, no i it's a great question um and um I, only thing i can say is i'm sure that in uh, some seminary level classes there is you're gonna right? have that right. yeah but but at a at a college level i think and like a religion major level or at the south carolina Wesleyan pastors gathering in a couple of years. I would, I would, I would definitely Ooh. throw her name in Ooh. for coming in and and yeah. talking about this. <laughs> Absolutely, just yeah. blew up hey, right there. Yeah, she <laughs> would be awesome for a pastors conference. Bring her yeah. in, um, and like let her ha- be the keynote speaker for all your sessions. Yeah, I, yeah. I, let me just say this: turn we, it into a classroom. Don't forget, we believe in this book so much that we're giving away right. a copy. And after the show, you can go to the TechologyShow dot com slash giveaway, or you can go to our special link. Techalo.gy slash giveaway, <laughs> which I, I was waiting for it to be oh, right there. There, there it is. Oh, right look there. at you there. Perfect hand, timing. Hand model. Um, All right. And then if you don't win, just go buy it on our Amazon link, link. which that's what I Buy said. a case of them. Buy Give a case them away. of them. Uh, and, you know, in the chat room, uh, shout out to Doug Dennis. I think that's Doug Dennis. I'm assuming it's Doug Dennis who actually did a series called Dusty Disciples on her book. Oh, um, very good. Yeah, he so was one to like, hit the like. If on you'd like Facebook. his sermon notes, just uh, <laughs> Facebook friend him, and he will send you all Love the graphics it. and everything. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so let's move on to they said it. Read my lips. I'm going to say this again. I've never taken steroids or HGH. I took the initiative in creating the internet. The Macintosh of all the machines I've ever seen is the only one that meets that standard. Well, I'm not a crook. If you, if you know what you're doing here, slide, slide out. Law wasn't just a platonic truth, abstract and distant. It turns out I actually believed it was some kind of person, as well as truth. And there was one religion that seemed like the most promising way to reach back to that living truth. Leah Labresco explaining why she is no longer an atheist source, the blaze. Google Smart Lens works by putting a minuscule sensor a hair-thick antenna, and a chip the size of a piece of glitter between two contact lens layers. The sensor is in contact with the tears naturally found on the surface of the eye and can take readings of glucose levels once per second. The lens can communicate with an external device and receives the power it needs wirelessly, storing it in a tiny capacitor. Senior editor Bogdan Petrovan reporting on Google's contact lens that monitors sugar levels for diabetics. Source, Android Authority. 
I was a freshman in college when Facebook came out, and I distinctly remember thinking, why would I need this? I have AOL yes. Instant Messenger and MySpace. Right. Well, times have changed. <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, and a slew of other sites I'm not cool enough to know about have simultaneously brought us closer together and driven us further apart. With the exception of a few universally offensive statements or pictures, it's a rule-free zone where we can interact with society while accepting minimal personal responsibility for the implications of what we do. Freelance writer and stay-at-home mom Kara Joyner, in her article, Five Questions to Ask Before Posting to Social Media, Source, Relevant Magazine. Oh, yeah. Hold video. on here. It's There's a video. A, yes. <laughs> video is coming your yes. way, live here on the Technology <laughs> Show. Now, we've done a lot of talking about Macintosh recently, but today... For the first time ever, I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. And the custom that I am to public speaking, I'd like to share with you a match and I saw the, the first time I met an IBM mainframe. Never trust a computer you can't with. Obviously, I can talk, but right now, I'd like to sit back and listen. So it is with considerable pride that I introduce a man who's been like a father to me, Steve Jobs. If you see the rest of that clip, it goes on for a while. Um, people, by the time it's over, there are hundreds of people and they are on their feet. I mean, it's like just uh, this frantic. And so, in studio, this is yeah. the 30th anniversary yeah. of the Macintosh computer. In studio, right, right there. Here. Right there. The same one he had on stage. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, I remember... Uh, the same model he had on stage. 1993, college freshman, I go to the computer lab at Southern Wesleyan University. I'd never had any interaction with computers, really. And um, stuff's buzzing here. And I just remember all those machines are DOS except for one. There's a there was an Apple machine in there, and I and Doctor Smoops used Apple machines. I used to think, dude, this is never going to catch on. And now <laughs> Mac, Mac, Mac. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna go over there. Tony's got his yeah. phone set up as a remote camera. Uh, we're gonna go over here and open up Mac Paint just for the yeah. fun of it. Yeah. So Heath, you can he, describe he, what's he, happening. We don't have mics. Cross, cross your fingers there. because this may or may not work. <laughs> All right, so Matthew and Tony, they're getting closer to the machine. There it is. You can see the lines because of the uh, the interface that we're having. And TG oh, is no, clicking on no, it. No, no, no. It's not working. He's clicking on it. Nothing's happening when I click. <laughs> Nothing is happening when he clicks. Could be a faulty mouse. What? There's only one button. <laughs> okay. It's a one button mouse. <laughs> we call this a fail? Yeah. Explain oh, fail. So I can move my mouse, but this, this He can button, move the mouse. The button is and let me just say this the if I'm not mistaken, this is a disc that you made. It's not fa a factory disc, correct? Well, this isn't a factory disc. This is so, let me, let me show this you is not know. Apple's fault. This, this machine, we, so, uh, what, should I name names? Yeah, go ahead. Right, yeah, because so we appreciate actually, it. This is actually Buddy Rampy's Buddy Rampy, uh, uh, Mac that we're, yep. that we're running here. And it has been sort oh. of in an attic for a long time, which uh, it was not Where good. moth and right. rust right. destroyed. Do corrupt. So yeah. they messed up the oil <coughs> inside the drive. So this was actually mechanical. Like, I remember back on my first Pentium 386s, there was a button you had to press to eject the drive. This thing was like your CD drive is in your Mac Pro, or when you put it in, right. there's no button. It just, just sinks hit it. And, this and, and slides to, out. Back in the day, it used to just lift it. So it was, I mean, it's just that's <coughs> incredible to me. So um, here we go. <coughs> See here, you have to use a paper clip now to get the disc out so it ejects it. Oh, I don't know if I can do this while I'm in clip. This is exciting is podcasting right here. Uh, uh. <laughs> I, uh, can't, I can't get it out. That's yeah, right. it's all right. Uh, anyways. It was a fail. Well, here's what I like. Here's what I think is all really right. cool. All right. 30 years later, I'm still using a similar interface. Right. Yeah. It blows my mind that in that 30 years. 30 years is basically the same machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty that, much. That I, the first time I sat down behind, you know, that, totally familiar. 
Yeah. Really familiar. And, and it really was revolutionary. I mean, um, with, within the year uh, after the Macintosh, there are computers that people won't be familiar with, but you had the Atari ST, which is right behind you. It had the same kind of an interface. The Amiga uh, was put out by Commodore. It had the same kind of interface. And it... And what we call in in the business a GUI, it had a graphical user interface. What talk, we call talk, in the business. We, that was what, let's uh, let's talk about this because it came with two monitors. You had to buy two monitors. For you didn't that have Atari. to. Well, but, but, but if you wanted color, there was a color and a black and white. So talk about like you use the color. If you one. wanted high resolution, then you would buy a monochrome monitor. But it but a color monitor would do everything. But when you got into like your word processor on a color, color monitor, monitor, you could the see, pixels uh, were so bad. <laughs> I mean, you could do it. But it was hard on the eyes, and so I got a free one. Uh, a friend of mine gave me a free monochrome, which was really nice. So I had, you, you could not play games on a monochrome monitor. You had to have a color monitor to play games. That's and excellent swap marketing out, so had, on there. I mean, before. didn't you have to like literally shut the thing down, put the right yes. monitor yes. on it, and then boot it back boot up? Boot it back up. It's fascinating. Yeah. And the, the way that that, that that Mac works, like it, it has a 128K memory. So it reads the system off of the disk. It stores that in the memory while it's on. But then you eject the disk and you put your program disk in. And then you fire up your program. That gets right. loaded into the memory. Then if you want to save something, you eject that disk. The program's still running in the memory. You put a save disk in and you do that. Back in the old days, the MacWrite uh, program, the word processor, all right, eight pages. It was the Macs on it? Eight pages. No way. I read somebody who was no talking way. about how eight it was their pages. first machine awesome. for their writing that they did. They loved it. And as they were as they were writing, they could get eight pages at a time, at a time on a floppy disk. I love it. Wow. <laughs> that, that's, yeah, it's amazing to think of that. So glad. It, I mean, every computer changed. you have today, um, and I would even talk about tablets and stuff like that, it was the interface. Apple figured out the interface. They were first. I mean, there yes. were other people definitely who were working on it, but they were the first out of the gate, the first to... First to just really say, hey, check this out. This is because it was command line. Everything was command line. Right. And I used to have a computer that, that did that. It was DOS. It ran off an old DOS and oh, C yeah. prompts and you put in your and then it would get a little bit graphical when it would go, but there was no mouse. Like you weren't you weren't doing that, but yeah. Yeah. You know. Ninety three, again, we're talking twenty one years. Golly. Come on, keep going. Keep going. Long long time ago. Ninety three, my computer class at Southern Wesleyan University, which was required. Right. Everything was on DOS. Matter of fact, the the final ex, the final exam was you had to create a, uh, a a database and a spreadsheet and write letters using the addresses. So you write you basically had to create a form letter. That was the final. Here, exam. Here's what's crazy: from not, I had my first personal computer in 1986. I never did prompt. I never did um, commands right. command lines. I always had a graphical user user interface because I started out with the Atari, mm -hmm. and I would watch people with DOS. And I would think, wow, these poor people. I mean, yeah. just, I mean what's it like but living we have in a, that we world? We have a mutual friend who never thought graphical user interface would ever catch on. Bill Cody used to say that, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he when he's when I when I showed him, he said, "Oh no, there's something called DOS shell. That's all you ever really need is a DOS shell." I don't even know what a DOS shell was, <laughs> but it was still command line. And and of course, by about. Year 2000, Bill was finally ready to <laughs> recant. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> a couple other things here, stories that we covered. I just thought that the Google story with the lens, great human interest story. I know some people with um, diabetes, and if they get this lens figured out to where it's practical for its use, um, yeah. I mean, God bless them, because part of this thing of constantly monitoring yeah. your glucose levels, and if this can be done now with a contact lens, and that every be... second, every second. All I got to say is you better watch out, because Wilford Brimley is going to be after you. you did not pronounce it right. It's diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> diabetes. I'm Wilford Brimley. <laughs> I, I found that the first story you be, sent... Can you see Wilford Brimley being the, being the spokesperson for this Google contact? I'm Wilford Brimley, and I'm here to talk about the diabetes Google. <laughs> it goes in your eye. <laughs> <laughs> you put it in right before you eat your oatmeal. Uh, so anyway, uh, so this first story we did, we're not talking about uh, Leah Labresco. This was not someone who is just a casual atheist. This is somebody who is an atheist blogger. I would call like, it atheist evangelist. Yes. I mean, she, yes. and, and, and 
And I'm telling you, she didn't just, she converts to Catholicism. This isn't just, you know, she went to a church and she checks the box and just, she announces on the atheist blog, hey. I'm done. It's been nice, guys. I'm done. I'm switching teams. Yeah, and here's what What courage. What fascinates me about her story is for some people out there, they may be familiar with the name of um, uh, Bertrand Russell. He was known as the Great Atheist. And Bertrand Russell, who would debate Orthodox Christians, would always say that the weakness for the atheist was the moral question. He, yeah. he admitted he admitted that when he got in debates, that was the hard one, and that the Christians pretty much owned the moral question. Um, and, and he would concede that you're right, one cannot talk about absolute morals if there's not an absolute moral uh, lawgiver. Yeah. And it's fascinating to me that Leah here, this was the thing. It, it was the moral question that finally brings her cross because yeah. there's yeah. you know something within her that says, you know, wait a minute here, um, it seems like that there is a right and wrong within the universe. Mm. Um, there is there ought to be a way that we govern the way that we live our lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's almost like it's in our DNA. Yeah. Hey, okay. Real quick now, the last story. This yep. is one TG you actually sent my way. Yeah. yeah. I just thought this is what I call good common sense stuff. Yeah. Um, and she has five questions that you should ask yourself: Am I seeking approval when I post something, mm-hmm. you know, on social media? Am I boasting? Of course I am, especially when I go to Packers game, yeah. right? Um, am I discontent? Is this a moment to protect? Which mm-hmm. I think is a great one. Yeah. We have some kids who are growing up online at the hands of their parents. Yeah. And yeah. maybe not as much needs to go out there. Uh, I think yeah. we had, was David Drury who said he's actually worked out rules with his kids. What yeah. can be posted? Yeah. What can To get permission yeah. from them. Right. Yeah. 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 The um, the last one is is it kind? Yeah, and and we have seen. I mean, listen, can't name names. You obviously can't do that. But <laughs> we, we want to. We can't. But we want to. I saw a conversation online mm-hmm. through a social media thing that was so inappropriate, and especially for the believer. I wanted to say, at some point here, would you reflect would you reflect the character of Christ? Yeah, and pull out of this conversation, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. The the thing that I am, you know, I am a social media addict. You know, oh, my this, name is Heath. I'm a social media. We addict. need to do an intervention. For so, him. so this kind of thing, I, I'm really going through how and when I use social media. Um, just you know, really thinking practically how I use it, but also, I, you know, I had something happen to me yesterday. My immediate thought was, "Oh, I can't wait to text so and so. Can't wait to post about this." Yeah. And then it hit me: we live in a world where there are no secrets anymore. In that the there world. is nothing that there is are no just, more secrets. No more secrets. And um, the book so I'm so I made this. I made this <laughs> conscious choice. Yeah. That, you know what, I'm not going to tell anyone else this, but I'm going to tell my wife, and it's just going to be between us. Well, and that's it wasn't, a novel idea. Well, I mean, and it was, but for, listen, for me. For you, yeah. For me. I've seen it some of your easy. stuff, yeah. It's pretty, yeah, pretty hair-raising. Um, uh, but for me. Yeah, you got to take huge... down that live stream camera out of your shower. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Man. Hey, people need to hear me sing at 7.30 in the morning is all hey, I'll say. Okay, so we need to wrap things up. Um, Real quick here, we're a little disappointed. Uh, Russell Moore, who we've had booked for eons, I, I got an email from his assistant saying something urgent's come up, but they have rebooked for April the 15th. Hey, so, okay, good. We have a date. Yeah, okay. we have a date. And so, and we totally understand sometimes things happen in life. So we appreciate, especially. Um, his assistant getting back to us right away saying, "Hey, let's you know, let's do it for April fifteenth. That's tax day." Gotta yeah. say, we yeah. are we are still excited about this show. Yeah. We've been yeah. wanting to talk to him for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so next week is a surprise. Oh, I have no idea. What's going on. <laughs> I'm nervous. Yeah, I'm just saying this. It might have something to do with the shower cam and heat. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Hey, you will find out here first who won the Super Bowl. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> uh, and don't hey, don't forget we got great guests coming up. But don't forget the TechnologyShow dot com slash giveaway. You, we're giving away three books this week, two separate giveaways. Enter as often as you like. Tell your friends. Tell everybody. 
that you can enter to win. Oh, and and we're in the we we're in the mining business now too, which yes. we haven't talked about. <laughs> yeah, yes. which we haven't talked about. So I have one no day, idea what this day is. One day we are going to talk about <laughs> cryptocurrency. But uh, here's if you'd like to to leave us a, uh, a Doji Coin uh, donation. There's the address to do it. We have three dollars worth yes. of Doji Coin right yes. now. So just keep sending us the Doji Coin. All right. Well, that being said. <laughs> <laughs> the cryptocurrency thing just goes right over he said probably most of it. Well, when I think of it, I think of Superman 3 where Richard Pryor's working at this company. He's like, hey, they shorted me a couple of cents. Like, yeah, you know, it's in the computers. And so Richard Pryor writes his program to collect all these lost pennies and cents, and he gets like a $100,000 check. Hey, any true Superman fan would not know about that movie. Hey. Listen, <laughs> Superman three more so is more of a Superman movie than Superman Returns. Whatever you hit, what? none of them, but none of them. What? Stand. Superman Returns. You guys will take does this, not exist in my take mind. Take this off the air and fight it out. Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, real quick, February the eleventh, we have Heather Zempel. She'll be our guest. We're going to talk about her book, Community's Messy. She is. Um, on, on Mark Batterson's staff up at uh, yeah. was it National Community? Yeah, yep. And in charge of small group there. So looking forward to that. Listen, if you want to do further research on anything we discussed today, you can find all the links to the stories we covered at our website, thetechnologyshow.com. If you want to contact us, please send your emails to thetechnologyshow at gmail.com. Or better yet, why don't you pick up the phone? Do you know? That if you dial 3049-Teology, you can leave a voicemail. We may even play those voicemails on the air. As always, thanks for joining us. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. We'll see you later. Windows tablet right here. Get that thing out of here. Rock and Metro.